Uh, okay, so now we are we moved our location into a very nice uh, Albert Park uh, Lake. Is there some kind of specific name of the lake? No, it's Albert Park Lake, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah very nice day. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice lunch and uh, coffee. All right. So um, we stopped at uh, about the agency, and I actually had one question to discuss. Actually, yeah. uh, do you do you want to go to the measurement program? No, we will no. come back to that. Yeah. So the, the the issue that I wanted to raise was that the agency, uh, from the psychological or some neuroscientific point of view, especially recent you know studies have kind of accumulated the evidence that it's not the kind of the notion that you consider as a coherent thing. It's a collection of many functions or many different things which can be contradictory to each other and are very unstable over the time. So that, that's a kind of, you know, the overall impression that I- Is that an empirical statement or is yeah, that empirical, necessary? Empirical. No, 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 it's not necessary, but you know, it's also consistent if you, you know, introspect yourself, right? Like, let's say, that there is a probably deep notion about you know or belief about the self in the western culture or philosophy or religion right and then everything you observe in the world exists objectively and you as a self interact with the world and that's how you perceive things or major things but this you know notion of the self uh, in the modern psychology and neuroscience is something more like you know this self is sometimes disappearing easily or appearing and uh, depending on how you interact with the object or a person many different as aspects actually appear sure. so within yourself you know all the time you tend to have this you know conflicting self yeah like you know whether you want to work with this you know, organization or pursue your own you know yeah. goal right that's not also you know coherent notion of the agency or self so I think, you know, but, but I would say that's an intrinsic part of agency or at least in a conscious agency. Right. And this is, ties in with what Penrose's idea that you have to have some level of randomness. If, if you are fully predictable mm. and coherent, then I can basically write down an equation for you and then you're not an agent anymore. So, but, but the, that kind of a notion is that the, there is a single agent, but that itself fluctuates randomly. Yeah. Right. What I'm thinking is more like, you know, in parallel, there are many kind of agency like you know thing uh, thing in the brain and that is uh, you know sometimes interacting and uh, you know not and uh, there's no at least you know single place in the brain that corresponds to your free will source or agent you know source that, that's a sort of empirical you mean that's kind of emergent from all the in a sense output. emergent yes yeah so but that that's sort of different from the, the maxwell demons kind of idea right single thing observing something rather you know in, in a sort of the extreme kind of you know uh rephrase um, i would say that every time it interacts with something there is an one aspect of the agency and then sometimes it can be coherent but sometimes you know it's inconsistent so i i i would say that uh, within within an individual uh, you know, i, I don't disagree with you but i think if i were to have if i were to write down various agents say now a now b now c i think i can collect them and mm. ascribe them as and, a single agent yeah it's kind of like you know like you can do a sort of a, i don't know what's the best term but some sort of a coarse graining many yeah. body physics to few body yes. physics coarse graining so mathematically i think it's Probably equivalent. Yes, in the sense that, I mean, I guess from a fairly sort of mathematical perspective, I can think of agents as things that accept stimuli and then choose actions at certain steps in time. And uh, and you can have an agent made out of many agents cooperating or not cooperating. And in the end, they come up with collective yeah. actions yeah. on collective stimuli. Yeah. And so one can sort of, uh, Calvin's notion is one can collect all these agents together and they interact, but, and it might be very hard to predict what they all together will do, but the final action can be sort of as an agent in itself. So agents in this sense can be a community of individuals or a single individual or, you know, cells in that individual. And uh, 
and uh, obviously uh, these things are uh, the uh, not all the cells in a person's body necessarily cooperate, certainly not everyone in a community cooperates. Uh, but in the end, some mechanism there causes them to make some sort of choose a collective action. Yeah, but then, okay, so just to make, make it clear. So you're saying that, that you are from your perspective or physics perspective, you would allow or you would uh, admit uh, there's there can be some kind of multiplicity of the agency across the different levels yeah and yeah, they yeah. can be inconsistent but they can also uh kind of a coexist mm -hmm. and uh, at some level you can assign mm -hmm. or read out some kind of yeah. an agency at some yeah. particular level that yeah. is a core strain yeah. or something i mean like if that. you think about even certain machine learning algorithms uh, um, they are actually if you look at how they work underneath they they run multiple different uh, procedures so so they might run a neural network they might also run a genetic algorithm and these things you know come up with their own decisions and yeah. afterwards they uh, take some overarching mechanism take some sort of weighted average of these to make a collective yeah. decision sort of uh if even AlphaGo, right they, they had different policy networks and so on yeah so that and they so you can think about different components as themselves as an agent but in the end like a community of people they come up with a collective decision so if we were to zoom into you your your white cells or uh, blood cells are going to have their agency and they have their task and and your um skin cells have their tasks and as we zoom out your organs look like they all have their agency they work with each other but but they do the thing that they're yeah. supposed to do can, you know maybe anthropomorphize the, the the organs uh and then we zoom out and then we see the collective agent now and then we zoom out and we see a collective agent that's the three of us and we can keep zooming out but at some so so maybe you can ascribe agency that is continuum but at some level is definite agent. Right? I mean, that white cell, blood cell is going to be doing the thing that white blood cells do, mm. and and you know exercise their agency with full authority. Um, so there are specific, and, and this happens a lot in, in uh, you know, you can think about it in life as well, right? You can look at uh, or biology. You can look at different scales, and you see mm. biological entities that are distinct have boundaries from other ones. Mm. Uh, but you can you know then you can also ascribe agency to society mm. um so yeah. we we kind of um actually wrote the grant together uh, uh to fqxi which was uh rejected in the end uh but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. we kind of you know, tried to formalize that idea as a um, in a sense you know re in the uh you know consistent with your idea that uh, this level of the description um that can be uh, considered as a you know uh, Asian is something that uh, maximizes the predictability of its behavior given yeah. the history mm -hmm. of the yeah. you know input or something like that, and that could actually uh, this arise was, this from was sort the, of the Felix's idea. Yeah, Felix's idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the minimum uh, like in you know, a scale like a you know, quantum level to you know society or you mm -hmm. know cosmos yeah. or something like that. It can go like you know at this level it's it's really huge. Mm. Like, you know, we can now predict at the level of cells and then goes down and then maybe at the level of the yeah. organs, we can uh, predict and then finally, like, you know, at the level of individual or society or something like that, you know, as a yeah. function of a scale, maybe this kind of, you know, predictability yeah. change. And uh, one of my current postdocs is, is an expert in, in, in this uh, idea of renormalization and normalization group flow. And the, the idea there is to Fact. And maybe when you are asked me earlier if I'm working on a specific problem, and maybe, maybe this is the most, the, the closest, right? So the idea is that suppose you have these combs at different time scales, right? So you have agency exercising at different times, the space time scales, if you will. You can ask the question suppose uh, I, I, I look at this and then I zoom out. Mm. And then I zoom out and I can look at different different scales, orders of magnitude mm. scales of, of space and time mm. or energy and momentum, doesn't matter. Then can I deduce um, some, co some, some, er some regions where I have some coherent agency, mm. right? And, and uh, this is almost in certainly required for any, any mathematical theory of consciousness and agency has to be able to scale that um, at, at different levels and may, you may you will not get conscious at all scales you'll get it at some scales though mm. uh, because you can go ahead look at your organs and 
ask whether they're conscious when they're dead. We mm. wouldn't know how to answer that, right? Mm. Yeah, so that, that, that's the sort of the kind of, you know, um, riddle or things that I want to also ask the physicists, right? The physicists uh, tend to probably, you know, since the time of the Galileo, uh, to lim limit themselves uh, for something that is observable outside. And then even though it is the only thing that you can observe directly, the internal subjective side as a sort of, you know, outside of the realm of uh, physics. But uh, the quantum, uh, you know, uh, theory starts to ask you to think really about this side. Impossible to avoid, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So I think this was a big philosophical, con uh, say, discomfort, I guess, when uh, when the start the beginning of quantum mechanics, right? right. The, the unavoidable necessity of including the observer yeah. in the description of how the uh, how a system will evolve. Yeah. I mean, tra traditionally, physics is based on the fact that we, as you say, we look at extrinsic things outside ourselves. Right. And we can describe the evolution of physical systems without description of the observer. Right. But uh, quantum mechanics basically stated that the observer is fundamental yeah. in sort of how a system behaves, that right. the act of observation changes right, us, right, right. which forces us to think about yeah. And this is why I don't observer. think the measurement problem is a quantum mechanical problem. It's just that it, it predates it, right? It's a problem that exists for uh, Galileo and Newton and mm. all of them, right? Because uh, they, they only can ascribe the world detached from them. Quantum mechanics says that, no, you, you're no longer allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem existed before. We just we were just able to ignore it and sleep okay at yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. Now, we're not allowed to do that. Yeah, so I, I kind of encountered a very interesting uh, passage uh, in a book on phenomenology that uh, described the history of the uh, philosophy. By the way, I think the audience actually quite a, uh, get amused that you know many of the statements and also historical uh, you know uh, sort of the facts about you know physics and the quantum mechanics actually have a very strong tie with the philosophy itself, yeah. right? Mm. And uh, you know they f both FQXI and also in our you know NOC near uh, uh, network of excellence uh, contain another you know philosophers actually, and uh, surprisingly. You guys and also philosophers uh, have, uh, you know, several points of contact, actually. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, uh, a long time ago, most physicists did dabble in philosophy. Yeah. Uh, all the, uh, in, you know, centuries ago, uh, a lot of philosophers were physicists. There was a continuum between philosophy, mathematics, and physics. Um, you know, Bertrand Russell being one of those people, Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And, Kelvin, but, uh, but Kelvin think, McQueen was also like that, yeah. But, but I think what happened was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, and, and in the 50s even, there was this idea of shut up and calculate, and, uh, and FQXI is sort of, you know, like, well, okay, no, let, let's, let's not just do that. Let's not just uh, mm -hmm. calculate the whatever complicated mathematics you need for string theory. Let's yeah. actually think about the structure of the world. That's right, 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 right. Um, yeah, and, and and quantum information theory naturally goes there, right? Yeah, you, you cannot do this without understanding the structure of the world. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's really the reason why I kind of learn so much from this, and also um, think about rethink about even consciousness as well. And then, yeah. So the the thing that I wanted to mention was that it was Kant, Emmanuel Kant, it seems, yeah. that he uh, who made it clear that uh, anything uh, the science can actually measure and also reliably theorizing should be based on some kind of quantity that is not influenced by the observation itself, right? So his, you know, influence is probably pretty strong outside of the people who are, you know, who don't know the quantum, uh, you know, stuff, but uh, it is really observation makes the change uh, of the state. Uh, and you can't really assume this realism, right? Like, um, maybe it relates more to what Mila was saying uh, yeah. in the last session that that information implies whatever you write down the, the mathematical statement and a correlation to some physical reality. Right. Mm. Well, it doesn't have to be physical, but some something else. Mm. Um, and uh, and maybe that's that's at least that is Kant's statement suggests that connection. Yeah. So, but but you know that that statement actually applies both to all the phenomena. Uh, studied in this uh, super micro uh, scale uh, yeah. uh, quantum mechanics, but also 
consciousness and also many of the psychological phenomena, right? Like if you ask question, you know, that already, you know, changes the state of your brain. Yeah. Mm, yes. So that, that's one of the reasons why Kant thought that, you know, introspection and also, you know, many of the psychological things cannot be mathematized, um, you know, in the, you know, ultimate sense. But if you think of I, this, I, you know, I, yeah. I, I disagree with that. And, and, right. and here's the reason, right? And I'll give you a very technical answer for that. Yeah. Right. You have exactly this problem in, in quantum stochastic process. Right. Right. Because of what, what, what a classical stochastic process is that, you, you know, you, you sit here and you observe birds and you count how many birds you see of different types. Right. And then, you know, you divide by the time you spend there and you say that, well, there are so many you know, mm. birds. You look at the birds, but you don't actually interfere with the birds. Right. right? And, and you can make a probabilistic statement about what kind of birds there are in this park. Right. But um, as soon as you go to quantum mechanics and you try to make uh, a st statistical statement or stochastic statements about a process, yeah. As soon as you look at the quantum system, you 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 disturb it. Yeah. And so, the, the system reacts backwards right, in right, the future. Right, right. Very much you can, in quantum every quantum stochastic process is essentially an agent in itself. Right. It, exactly. It, it responds to your stimuli of looking at it. Because in quantum mechanics, the fact that you're looking at it is basically you interacting with, you're sending information to it and it absorbs that and adapts to it. So, and so very important people in quantum stochastic processes even claim today that, that you cannot define a quantum stochastic process because there are no Kolmogorov extension theorem, some, some technical thing. Mm. Turns out that is bullshit. You can do it perfectly well. You can actually write down a background process and and you just take the agent out and you can describe the interaction between the two uh, the background and the agent in a perfectly coherent way yeah mm. um so 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 that's why i'm saying that even though it seems that it's going to be impossible to write down a quantum stochastic process well in fact it is possible that would be and interesting can... actually adapting this stuff to look at classical adaptive agents you know but it's, it works out the same i'm right? in, sure it works out fact, the same so you can prove this is what the, i'd like to talk about on thursday so you can prove a generalized version of kolmogorov theorem yeah. and it reduces exactly down to the original kolmogorov theorem when you take the classical limit yes so um so, so, so that's why I'm saying that I, I wouldn't be so pessimistic. Uh, I think what a lot of people did and do think that you can't, you can't mathematically write down something that self-reacts. But actually, maybe you can. Mm -hmm. well, uh, even in the complexity theory, people write down classical stuff that self-reacts. Uh, yeah. And they write it in the language of transducers, but it's very easy to still represent them as a finite state machine. That, uh, with inputs and outputs, so it describes a classical agent. There are many ways to represent them. So it's uh, true, you can't write down a statistical distribution over a fixed set of inputs and outputs, but uh, but anything which reacts to the environment, you can't do that. That's not just quantum, even classical objects. Okay. I mean, I, I don't really at least, you know, I'll subscribe any of the Kant's, you know, stuff, right? And the, uh, my entire project is actually going against this kind of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Good. So, so we're in the same- yeah. Same table. Yeah, but, but you know, <laughs> one of the things that I also wanted to talk today was this, you know, quantum cognition approach. And that's kind of related to this type of thinking, actually. So they, they um, the according to, you know, some of the things that are uh, written by Jerome Busemeyer, who is my collaborator and also one of the key persons in quantum cognition, wrote that uh, uh, the, or, uh, at least some of the origin of the complementarity uh, kind of you know idea in uh, quantum uh, physics uh, originates from um, inspiration from psychologists like you know uh, William James and also uh, subsequent you know, disciples uh, you know took this uh, phenomena of you know observation or uh, probing itself changes the mind seriously so sometimes you know the um, answers to two questions like you know uh, uh, do you like um, let's say Morrison, and then do you like uh, um, the, uh, the 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 uh, you know Victorian uh, you know um, guy? If you if I ask these kind of two questions in A then B, sometimes the uh, you know the order of B then A makes a completely different kind of you know uh, answers. Yeah, and uh, this as a sort of the. Um, as a sort of inspiration of this you know, complementarity idea and so on, you know, uh, contributed to this uh, non-commutativity of the quantum mechanics. 
it is certainly true that yeah. there are a lot of mirror images, uh, especially in the context of uh, contextuality. Yes, exactly. Which is where, you know, a baby, if they ask whether they're hungry, depending on whether they ask, do you like broccoli or do you like ice cream, right. is likely to give vastly different answers. Yeah. Uh, well, not a baby, but they can speak a child. Uh, and uh, because the sta their state of mind is affected by the previous question. Right. So the quantum notions of these things are a little bit more subtle yeah. because the classical ones assume that there is some sort of memory and that memory is updated. So the baby sees that, uh, 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 sees that okay, I have been asked, uh, do, um, I, do I like broccoli? My mind updates, oh, they think I'm gonna eat broccoli, I'm not hungry. So yeah. this that sort of mechanistic update. Yeah. But quantum mechanically, when you go into, uh, when you track these questions, so they ask over two different space right, threshold right. points, um, can still exhibit this sort of update effect. Right. Even though the update, to have that update effect, the update effect must traverse faster than the speed of right, light. Right, right, right. Which is, uh, most people consider that to be impossible. So right. that's what was referred to as non-local. So yeah. if we believe in this sort of realistic update rule, the only way to get consistent statistics, consistent right. with quantum mechanics, right. is for, you know, so Alice has asked one question, but Bob somehow reacts to it. And the only way to explain it using this sort of update rule is to assume that that update goes faster than the speed of light, right. uh, which means in certain reference frames, it looks like the question was asked, uh, the, uh, the person updated the memory before the question was asked. Right, right, right. So. Uh, this is why quantum mechanics is referred to as a non-local realistic, yeah. uh, non, either non-local or non-realistic. Right. So if you assume there's a realistic update, then it has to go faster than the speed of light. Yeah. And uh, and so it's a little bit more subtle, but yeah. you're right. There, there is an element of that in there, in that the sense that you, know, you can think about it as, uh, uh, in a way, as the environment or the system updating. But if we do think that way, we have to ascribe that the universe as a whole is like almost a single entity that update here can affect something anywhere else now i think most physicists are less comfortable with this notion of non-locality and prefer non-realism which is to say that the the, um, the thing doesn't really update in this sort of realistic sense and never has a reality of what how it's going to answer mm. till the moment it's asked which is a uh, which is where Einstein's quote, I refuse to believe right, that the moon right. isn't there if I don't look at it, comes from. Speak spooky action at distance, right? Well, yes. that would be the other one, right? Yeah. So, so you can either have that this quantum particle has a state, mm. so that would be realism. Mm. But if it does, then then you would need to have spooky action at a distance when you measure the other one. Mm. Or you can say that this doesn't have a state. It's not. There's no real description right. for this. Uh, right. Uh, and I think most of us uh, like to give up realism. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, uh, what? Why is that? Uh, I I don't know. Um, I guess I'm very comfortable giving up realism, not so much with locality. Yeah, I guess locality draws an uncomfortable notion that uh, that your cause can happen before effect in certain reference frames, right? If you if uh, with special relativity involved. Yeah, but I'm I'm smarter than. You know, I'm, I'm not a third grader. I know it doesn't, so I, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't mind giving up locality. Uh, I could go with a realistic non-local world. Yeah, I, I guess I could too. It might take, <laughs> take me a couple of days to get used to it. It's just, just as weird as the other one, I guess. But anyway, so, um, you know, I don't know. Um, so over the last year, and also, you know, still currently, I'm, I'm I've been learning about this uh, quantum mechanics and so quantum cognition now uh, to some extent. And then uh, I've encountered many of these kind of uh, arguments, right? And then what, what I realized was that the initial kind of, you know, uh, demonstration of uh, this, like, you know, uh, in, uh, violation of a better inequality like phenomena in, uh, you know, psychology has been uh, going under the quite a strong uh, criticisms because unlike, you know, Alice and Bob situation, yeah. We can't exclude the possibility that you know, there is some kind of common yeah. mechanism that uh, affects both, either you know stochastically or you know causally, you know deterministic. So that's and so that's on. allowed in the 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 Bell inequality, the co common right. thing, as long as it's yeah. from a distant past. Yeah, right. Yeah. But you know, in the case of the you know asking two questions to you know a person, they, this kind of thing cannot cannot be established. So, 
instead uh, well, what, it, it, yeah. it, it's it's more than that right i mean that person uh, so you could actually devise uh, questions where where, where uh, um, so imagine you can have an object right and you can ask five questions about that object and right. you can you can uh, devise the question so that you can ask things like you know uh, is it red um, and european yeah is it a uh, is it fast and a motorcycle yeah uh, or and and you know all of these questions those all both of these questions can be simultaneously satisfied but you can pose the questions so that yeah so uh, exactly that kind of thing was done pretty yeah. recently yeah and it's now uh, under the framework uh called a uh, contextuality yeah exactly by default yeah so wh what it says is that uh you know it's a kind of modified version of the better inequality where you put some kind of a you know, constant factor that is uh, the uh, maximum upper bound um, introduced by the, some uh, empirical co uh, correlation or among yeah. these you know, questions. Yeah, yeah. And so what they did was quite a uh, clever experiment, I thought. So um, at the minimum, um, the most convincing experiment was the following. It's like an liar circle kind of idea. Like if A says that you know, oh, B is telling the truth and B says, oh, C is telling the truth and then C says A is telling lie. Self inconsistency, right? Uh, as a whole, but locally it's consistent. Like if you look at the statement itself, it's right, right, you know right. okay. And then something similar can be introduced in psychological experiments by asking just uh, you know one, uh, two question of uh, out of three. So what they did was uh, using online you know kind of setting. Yeah. They asked, um, okay, so you need to choose uh, two meals. From the three meal, uh, you know, uh, menu, right? And then you never want to have high calorie and then uh, high calorie kind of, you know, course. You always want to have a high calorie and low calorie combination, right? Okay, so that that's the rule. Okay. And then I ask you guys, so starter wise, you can have either soup, which is high calorie, or a salad, a low right. calorie. And then as a main dish, you can have a hamburger that is a high calorie, or like let's say fish or something yeah. low calorie. Yeah. And then as a dessert, you can have either uh, something like a juice or uh, yeah. a hot cake or something, uh, yeah. that, that uh, cake, right? Yeah. High calorie. Then this guy actually made it so, so, you know, super interestingly. It's very difficult for me to choose high calorie soup and uh, high uh, low calorie uh, coffee as a sort of dessert. Right, because it's both, you know, kind of, you know, yeah. liquid, right? You don't want to have both to be liquid, right. even though it's high and low. So you yeah. put other, other restrictions. Other one, right? Yeah. Like low calorie salad and then high calorie right. dessert. That's yeah. the preferred one. Yeah. But, you know, if you consider other high calorie, low calorie kind of combination, you probably prefer coffee as a starter and then low calorie and uh, the, the the high calorie you know hamburger that looks more attractive so right. you know correlation wise it's correlated correlated anti so this is uh, basically frustrated correlations exactly. in many body systems where you have three spins and mm. two want to, uh, they want to be aligned aligned anti-aligned right, in a triangle right, right. and uh, and then you you're kind of stuck 